Well, good morning, everybody. Um, I want to thank you all for tuning in for today's panel discussion on the global financial forecast. This is a webinar presented by Smith, Smith Business Insight and by Queen's Executive Education. Um, my name is Daniel Tisch, and I'll be the moderator for our discussion today. I'm really excited about this. Um, so professionally, I'm CEO of Argyle. We're a communications and reputation advisory firm with offices across North America and uh, partners in the world's major financial centers. I'm also a, pr a proud Queen's uh, MBA, a former vice chair of the university's board of trustees and a faculty member uh, of the Queen's Accelerated MBA program for business graduates. Um, so today's discussion, it, uh, it's a really interesting one because it's of course about risk and opportunity, two words that are really important to all of our lives right now. Um, and it's a time when I, I got to say, I admire the bravery of those who will be sharing their thoughts with us today, because even the opportunity to make economic forecasts seems like a risk in itself. Um, even the term post pandemic is a bit of a moving target. Um, so for both companies and countries, uh, we have inflation, we have supply chain shortages, we have oil prices rising, we have geopolitical conflicts. Um, and all of this is, is altering our expectations for growth and for stability. Um, we've got some predicting a long boom um, because we've had two years of pent up demand uh, finally unleashed with fewer restrictions on our activities and where we can go and what we can do. Um, others feel though that we're in classic uh, VUCA territory, right? Prolonged period of volatility, uncertainty, complexity, ambiguity, which will it be? Well, our panelists today will help us uh, read the tea leaves and also um, based on research and data, understand um, understand uh, the issues and challenges that each of us needs to think about and watch no matter what happens where, whether it's as business leaders, as government leaders, nonprofit leaders, investors, or citizens. So anyway, it's gonna be fun. Uh, and so I just wanna say from a housekeeping uh, perspective, um, before I introduce the panel, I just wanna remind everybody that um, uh, we've got a, um, uh, if you want to ask a question today, and I hope you will, uh, I'd ask that you please use the Q&A button. You'll find it at the bottom of your screen. And so we'll get to questions uh, throughout the discussion. So please ask them early and often. And I also want to remind you that uh, the discussion today will be recorded. Uh, you'll receive a link to that recording by email before the end of the week. Okay, so um, our, our presenters today, um, we're going to hear from a leading academic researcher and two global investment industry leaders who focus their work and, and their, their careers on pricing risk and seizing opportunity in today's markets. So um, our first panelist is uh, Wei Wang, professor and distinguished professor of finance at Smith School of Business. Welcome, Wei. Uh, he's an expert on corporate restructuring, bankruptcy, distressed investing, leverage finance, and high yield bonds. He's had research um, published in top finance journals, uh, featured in the Wall Street Journal, Dow Jones, and other prominent media. Uh, he's taught at Wharton, uh, Hong Kong University of Science and Technology Business School, and he's the author of an authoritative book on finance, corporate financial distress, restructuring, and bankruptcy. Before his career in, in academia, he worked in commodity derivative trading and financial engineering. So he's got a very diverse background. He'll be our lead presenter today. Welcome, Wei, and thank you for joining us. Um, we also have Jerry Del Nissian. Uh, Jerry is the founder, executive chairman, and CIO of Copper Street Capital in London, England. Uh, so good afternoon, uh, Jerry. Uh, he's um, former chief uh, operating officer of Barclays Bank uh, and a member of the bank's executive committee. Before that, he was um, senior managing director of Bankers Trust in London and in Toronto, and also worked with Scotiabank. Um, and uh, Jerry is also um, a past chairman of the Securities Industry and Financial Markets Association uh, and served on the board of the Global Financial Markets Association as well. He holds a degree in chemical engineering from Queens and an MBA from the Smith School of Business. Welcome, Jerry. And our final panelist is Ted Goldthorpe. Ted, uh, uh, so we have London represented here. We also have New York, right? So Ted is, uh, joins us, he's a partner Head of Credit for BC Partners in New York, um, where he, which he joined in uh, 2017. He's a member of the Private Equity Investment Committee, most recently president of Apollo Investment Corporation, CIO at Apollo uh, Investment Management, Senior Portfolio Manager for US Opportunistic Credit. Previously with Golden, Goldman Sachs, 
And uh, like many of us, uh, he also um, gives back to uh, uh, the, the, the community through his uh, work guest lecturing at leading universities, including Queens, Columbia, Wharton, University of Virginia, NYU, Stanford University. Um, and like so many of us on this call today, uh, a graduate, very proud graduate of Smith School of Business, in his case, the Commerce Program. Thank you, uh, Ted, for joining us. We look forward to the conversation. Okay, um, so the first uh, step today, and I'll invite um, Wei to take the, uh, the floor and the rest of us will go off camera and on mute. Uh, he's going to uh, tee things up um, and share um, kind of a bit of a landscape overview with some key numbers, tell us uh, what's been going on lately, and then the rest of us will come back to uh, have the panel discussion. Wei, over to you. Oh, thank you, Dan, Dan for the kind introduction. And uh, good morning and uh, good afternoon to those in Europe and uh, good evening to those in Asia. Um, I think before we get to the, the discussion, um, it, 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 will, it will be helpful to provide some uh, background information, at least on where we are right now. Uh, I think many of you have uh, know uh, how the equity markets uh, performed in the past two years and where we are at right now. So my focus will be on the, more on the uh, credit markets and also on the macro side of the global economy. Um, so I'll be spending just five minutes going through very fast uh, to set up the background to this discussion. All right, so first of all, I want to show that um, the global indebtedness in terms of non-financial corporate debt, government debt, uh, debt issued by financial institutions, and also that together, as of today, we're standing about $300 trillion. So if you compare this level to the pre-pandemic level in 2019, that's a 20% increase. And this is US data um, showing the non-financial corporate debt uh, as a percent of GDP and the moving average of corporate default rates. As you can see that uh, we are at almost record low in terms of default rates as of last year. And uh, the corporate debt experienced a sharp increase right during the pandemic, uh, but it's come down quite a bit uh, in 2021. And leverage finance markets are booming. Uh, the leverage finance markets include high yield bonds and leverage loans. As you can see in 2021, there was a record issuance. Uh, so with corporate bonds and uh, leverage loans uh, in the US, together they account for about $1.3 trillion of issuers. That's a record high. In terms of high yield bond spread, uh, as you can see during the pandemic, the high yield bond spread shot up from about 5% to more than 10%. Typically we say when the high yield um, bond spread goes over 10%, uh, you know, we're looking at the recession and we did, but that session was very short. As you can see, the high yield bond spread came down quite a bit. Even with the recent uh, war uh, in Ukraine, uh, the high yield bond spread did not shoot up um, rapidly or fast. And uh, so we're still at a low level in terms of the high yield bond spread. In terms of bankruptcy filings, I guess uh, probably surprising or not surprising, last year uh, we saw the record low number of business bankruptcy filings. As you can see in 2021, that's a record low compared to the last three decades. And even on the consumer side, we also saw a record low number of consumer bankruptcy filings in the US as well. Another indicator I wanna point out, also people talk about a lot is the yield curve. Um, so we're looking at sort of flat to invert the yield curve between the two year and 10 year US treasury. Um, so this is where the yield curve stands at as of March 31st, 2022. It has been evolving, you know, on the daily. So uh, it's pretty much a flat or inverted kind of level right now. U.S. unemployment rate, uh, we're reaching pretty much the pre-pandemic level uh, at a very low. You can see this uh, unemployment rate picked up uh, during uh, COVID time, but uh, it fast uh, came down at pretty much we're reaching the pre-pandemic level. Similar as Canadian unemployment rate as well. The next one is the US inflation rate. As you can see, as of uh, February, uh, the meter rate was almost 8%. 
that's a record high in 30 years. Um, and in Canada as well, we are at almost a uh, recent high of the inflation rate. The last part I want to show is China as the still uh, the global manufacturing capital and also uh, with this unique uh, COVID policy. Uh, let's take a look at what's going on there. Um, you can see that since year 2012, the corporate debt amount in total in China has surpassed pretty much the US level uh, in terms of the uh, non-financial corporation debt. And um, it's still increasing, it increased, it still uh, increased quite a bit during the uh, post-pandemic period. The unemployment rate, um, as you can see, especially for the youth unemployment rate, it stays pretty high at over 14%. Uh, this is according to National Bureau of Statistics of China. And the, during COVID, uh, you can see there's a diverging pattern between what's happening in the US and Canada and what's happening in China. The unemployment start to take up, uh, pick up again um, you know, in 2021. Inflation um, compared to North America, inflation during COVID period, uh, the pandemic period, uh, is not very high. It stays around 1%. I guess when you look at unemployment rates picking up low inflation rate, because naturally you can think about you, the Chinese economy slowing down, which is, uh, is the case. Um, so as you can see, predicted GDP growth over the next five years is, is much lower than what China experienced in the past uh, 10 years. The last slide I wanna show is the Chinese onshore bond defaults. Um, I'm not looking at the, the offshore defaults. That includes the recent uh, Kaisa and a few other developers defaults in their uh, foreign debt. This is the onshore defaults uh, in Chinese massive corporate bond market. As you can see, uh, the first default really pick, uh, started in 2014. The first ISOE default started in 2015. This related to one of my papers looking at uh, Chinese bond markets uh, in general and how governments uh, play a role um, in working uh, in, in their default policy and also how their tolerance for default has changed over the last uh, five years. Okay, so that's pretty much all I want to show. Just set up uh, some background information uh, where we are. And uh, I really look forward to listen, uh, to hearing uh, what Ted and uh, uh, Jerry will uh, say about uh, you know, their thoughts. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Wei. Uh, so I'll invite uh, Jerry and Ted uh, to uh, to join us once again. And just a reminder uh, to members of the audience, um, after we have a bit of a chat among the panelists uh, in response to uh, Wei's numbers, uh, it'll be your turn. And, um, and and I'd encourage you to type in your, your questions in Q&A. So, um, well, um, really compelling stuff. Uh, and, uh, and thank you for focusing us on some of the data, uh, Wei. And maybe I'll just kind of go around the, the, the virtual room here. Um, and, you know, it's, it's kind of interesting because we're, we're now just over uh, two years uh, from the start of the, uh, the you know, the, 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 the worst effects of the pandemic or the effects we noticed the most, uh, you know, with the lockdowns beginning. And I guess I just want broadly, uh, I'd love to hear from, um, from, from you guys about uh, what stood out to you, what surprised you. Um, this has obviously been we hope a once in a lifetime event, um, but it ran two years. Uh, it's had some transformational impacts on um, on so much of our lives, but I'm curious about your thoughts on how it's affected the economy and markets. And maybe Ted, I'll invite you to kick off there. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> and thank you for um, thank you for having us. I mean, listen, this, this is obviously unprecedented. Um, you know, when we underwrite our investments, we aren't predicting revenues in certain cases go to zero. Um, so I would say there's a lot of interesting takeaways and a lot of surprising things that, you know, we did really well financially during the crisis, but there's a lot of things that were uh, surprising that, you know, we got wrong. So when when COVID first happened, you know, I'd say a couple things. One is it was um, unpre obviously unprecedented government intervention. A lot of things that you know, people had learned about in business school and we've talked about in economics departments, they actually implemented, um, you know, really around monetary stimulus was obviously a big thing in 2008, but we had coordinated fiscal and monetary stimulus at the same time. Um, but I would say the, the one thing that was probably the biggest surprise was the resiliency of companies, 
Uh, companies moved very quickly to um, shore up liquidity. Companies moved very quickly to control costs. So when you when you back tested what happened in 2020, you know the resilience of really the developed market economies um, and the companies that underlie, underlie them was uh, was phenomenal. People people reacted very quickly um, to to adjust their businesses to the new um, to the you know new normal. And I'd say, you know, there's a lot of focus on the companies that obviously did poorly, um, but there's a lot of companies that were big COVID beneficiaries. So anything that touched e-commerce, um, you know, companies that, um, uh, you know, had consumer uh, facing demand. So for example, anything consumer discretionary, you know, uh, has done phenomenally well, just given you put cash into pockets of people who actually spend money. And so there's a lot of sectors of the economy that did you know, much, much better than we would have expected, um, you know, ma mainly around consumer and this big theme around consumer. Um, so I think our biggest, yeah, our biggest surprise was how quickly things recovered. Um, and again, I would say how resilient uh, our respective economies really are uh, in the face of unprecedented lockdowns. Yeah, yeah, very interesting. Um, the, last Jerry, thing, the last thing I'd say, sorry, the last yeah. thing I'd say, and then, and then I'll pass it over to Jerry. The other thing I'd say is, you know, obviously, um, you know, all these themes that we've had for 30 years uh, or more, declining interest rates, globalization, bringing our economies closer together. This all started a little bit before uh, before you know, the pandemic, but now you're seeing the opposite. You know, rising rates, you know, people are, you know, this, this concept of Fortress America and, you know, delinking our global economy, which is, you know, what we've been working on for 40 years. Now we're going the complete opposite. So there's some real, all these things we've been, learning and doing for 40 years and around the global economy, a lot of that stuff is now, we're doing the complete opposite. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, Jerry, we'd love your perspective on this. Uh, obviously you're, you know, you, we've got Ted in New York, you're, you're in London. What's, what's, the, what's the perspective like from, from Europe um, in terms of uh, some of those trends that, uh, that Jerry was talking about? Yeah, so uh, very much um, like Ted, I was um, very surprised to see the speed with which um, everything um, rebounded. I suppose uh, you throw enough money at something, I mean, you'll get you'll get a response function. Uh, what what I would add, uh, given that uh, my own focus is on uh, banking and and uh, the financial services sector, um, it was really the first test uh, post financial crisis of um, the the resilience of, of um, the financial system. Um, and in Europe, uh, we, we, you know, the, the Europeans haven't been as uh, forthcoming, say, as the, as the um, Americans and, and uh, the British were in cleaning the system. And there's still a great deal of work that needs to happen in Europe. Notwithstanding that, um, you know, there, there were, precautions taken, dividends, bans were put in place and, you know, keep all the capital in the house, but they really weren't, um, they really weren't needed. And even, you know, taking into account that loan moratoria, all, all those sorts of, there were mitigants, um, you know, that um, were, uh, were also helpful. The reality is, I mean, the, the, the sector, held extremely well capitalized, never particularly um, threatened. And in fact, we saw um, a couple of very large uh, market events hit a few of the, of the banks. Um, and, you know, none of the sort of uh, nothing systemic um, revealed itself. So, you know, it's, it's certainly, um, a, a strong vote of confidence in this in the sustainability of where we're at. Interesting. Interesting. Can I, can I, can I make one more comment, actually? Which is yeah. Go ahead. The, you know the th the other thing which is is was concerning, I would say, is you know a lot of what underlies our investment uh, phenomenon is the efficient markets hypothesis, or that the markets are generally efficiently priced. And when you think about you know uh, what makes our economies so great. Part of it is the access to capital and reliance on our capital markets. So when we have phenomenons like Dogecoin or things like meme stocks, where you know you have companies that 
uh, market prices are completely divorced from fundamentals, but for sustained periods of time, not just for a day or two, but for long periods of time, you know, I think there's some things that are that are concerning. Um, yeah. You know, again, like we 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 pride ourselves globally on being able to efficiently price risk, and when things like that happen, which are completely divorced from any logic uh, yeah. or fundamentals, you know, there's it, we all like to follow it. It's interesting, but at the same time you know, that also has negative consequences as well that I think, you know, really will manifest itself over time. Yeah, I, I, absolutely. And, and I want to get way in, you know, uh, back into the conversation on that, because um, obviously looking ahead, um, you know, uh, I think uh, Ted's point about market prices being divorced from fundamentals, um, it really points to the importance of um, understanding what, you uh, um, what indicators we should be watching. And so I, I, I'd be curious as to your thoughts, Way. Uh, you presented a lot of interesting indicators. Are, are those the ones we should be watching? Are there others that, uh, that, uh, that you'd point us to, um, to watch in particular as we try to uh, look for you know, risks and opportunities in the year ahead? Yeah, so uh, I think to, to get to that, um, I just want to quickly build on what Ted and Jerry mentioned about what's experienced during the pandemic period. I think what really surprised, that also speaks to what we're going to focus in the near future. What really surprised me was the record amount of liquidity injected uh, by global central banks. And because companies were resilient, so that record amount of liquidity created a problem, which is you see the asset inflation, then we got to the regular CPI, the consumer consumption inflation. So we got the all kind of inflation going on. So I would say based on that, um, looking forward, um, I think I have probably, I would say two concerns. Um, what, one is people talk about supply chain interruptions and all of other things, how they um, are the important factors for uh, global inflation. But I think they're just icing on the cake. Um, even without those events, we'll see inflation anyway, regardless, which is, which is a record amount of liquidity, you know, money floating in the system. And the Fed actually has a $9 trillion balance sheet. So I was going forward, we had really watched what the central banks would do, um, mm -hmm. their mm -hmm. attitude, um, yeah. you know, being hawkish or being more tolerant. So that will determine whether we'll have a soft lending versus hard lending. Um, yeah. Another factor I'll be looking uh, at is the kind of differential kind of policies of different governments on a COVID. You know, in China, they have a zero tolerance you know, versus the Western countries, you know, to live with the virus. Because you look at the, right now, Shanghai being shut down, you know, the whole, the whole city. Shanghai port is one of the most important ports in China, you know, for the Yangtze River trade. You know, I, I just think this is gonna create very near term a supply chain problem again, you know? So I think going forward, we really have to watch uh, whether China will change its policy um, on COVID and, um, also the central bank's responses um, or their policy making. I, I, I want to pick up on your comments about inflation. Um, it's interesting, our firm, we did a, we do a survey with, with Leger in the US called the Confidence Report. And, and we were asking people, we asked American consumers about their, um, uh, you know, what, what their biggest worries were this year. And inflation was way ahead of COVID, right? As, as a concern for, uh, for ordinary Americans. And, um, and, and so I, I guess my question, I, I'd love to hear from Jerry and Ted, given, you know, the work that you do, um, how big a deal is this high inflation we're seeing? Is it, do you see it as, as, as temporary, um, you know, or is it, is it more like what we experienced in the 70s and 80s, uh, a long lasting concern that, uh, that was persistent uh, and stayed with us for a while? And yeah. uh, um, so I think it's a very big deal and it comes back to Wei's comment. In fact, Ted's, uh, you know, uh, comment about uh, meme stocks and markets being um, divorced from reality uh, ties in with, um, you know, just all the, the money that is sloshing around the system. Um, and we've had, you know, we've had zero rates uh, you know, with the with the exception of um, a a tight a small tightening cycle in 2018 that had uh, a pretty significant negative effect on risk assets, we've we've been in in zero rates for like 14 years, yeah, and we've just and we ballooned 
um, money supply. So, um, you know, the to think that uh, a central bank is going to be able to thread the needle um, and and sort of achieve a soft landing. I mean, this is really difficult. We're we yeah. have never been in a situation where central banks are so far behind the curve. Uh, and it isn't just, you know, two or three 50 basis point hikes from the Fed to get us there. And of course, now we've also got all this mountain of debt, um, you know, at the sovereign level and, you know, through, through the economy. And certainly in Europe, um, you know, that will raise the questions of sovereign debt sustainability again which those of you with memories going back to 10, 11, 12, um, you know, that that's, comes back. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, and, and then do the, you know, do the central banks, which have become much, much more political, have the, have the will to, um, you know, to go through with that adjustment process. And I wouldn't bet on it. Um, so yeah, I think it's a, it's a very um, big deal. Even yeah. even if you've got aspects of it that are that are uh, as Wei said, um, you know, will get resolved. Um, just the, the monetary uh, component here is is uh, you know that that's a that's a big yeah. elephant in this room. So so Ted, how is this how is this affecting your planning? Um, you know, uh, I'm, I mean, do you, do we expect you expect uh, with interest rates rising, uh, a wave of corporate um, bankruptcies, for instance, uh, you know, how, how is your strategy adjusting given uh, given this landscape? Uh, and uh, curious as to whether you agree with Jerry as well on this point. Yeah, a thousand percent agree. I mean, one thing, I, it's the one thing I, I keep saying that no one's talking about is, you know, 10% of the U.S.'s um, expenditures is debt service. And it's been 10% for a long time because rates keep going down. And you know this is going to blow a hole in the fiscal regimes of a lot of these countries. And on top of that, they're also making a lot of money from buying bonds. You know, the Fed is remitting money to the government from buying bonds that they're making money on that they're now unwinding. So I think this has a lot of real implications. You know, number one, you know, high yield bonds for a whole career are very credit sensitive. So to your point about bankruptcies, and over 90% of high yield bonds today are are trading at negative real yields. And again, you can you can we can debate what inflation is going to be going forward, but still, no matter what numbers you use. And if you buy a German bond today, even if you assume, you know, if you buy a 30 year German bond today and you assume 2% inflation, at maturity, that bond is worth 50 cents in real dollars. Or in, in uh, if it's 3% inflation, which, which you know, seems like a reasonable bet, you know, your, your bonds are worth 40 cents. So just like the, you know, it, there's a big question about where to put money. Like people, people are coming to us and saying, you know, they were hiding out and they were right to be safe in investment grade bonds and treasuries. The treasuries and investment grade bonds were down last year and they're down again this year. So mm -hmm. there's really nowhere safe to hide. So like, you know, right. equities are high, high yields at crazy tights and the worst investment you can make. And then you, if you put it into risk-free securities, they're down for two years in a row. So to put, so, you, so put, to, to put you on the spot then, how's your strategy change? So number one, we're very focused on supply chain. So... Yeah. This is inflation, I think, is a is part of it is I don't think companies really understood their supply chain. Like I think they did and they didn't, you know, and if this is really affecting industrial businesses, it's not so much affecting retail businesses. Mm -hmm. So we're very, very focused on on um, supply chain and industrials. So you, so your question about default rates, I think default rates, I think default rates understate the amount of stress. I think you're going to have because because there's no covenants and people have pushed out their maturities. I think you're going to have um, a number of companies trading at big discounts. We're, yeah. we're already seeing it. Amendment activity in our portfolio is through the roof. Um, just people can't make stuff and they've got debt and they've got debt service and they've got labor inflation and they can't find people. So there's a fixed cost to their business and if you can't make enough stuff, you know, that's a problem. Um, so we're already, we're already seeing that actually. And we're seeing a very aggressive move to reshore. You know, so people bringing back supply chains back to the U.S. and back to Canada and even to Mexico from, yeah. you know, far flung jurisdictions. So I think our strategy, I mean, we're pretty negative. I'm sure you can tell by my <laughs> voice. We're pretty negative. And, um, you know, 17 of the last 19 times the Fed's raised rates, we've gone into recession. Yeah. There's other, you know, usually when oil goes above 100, which it is right now, 
that pushes us in a recession because it's a tax on the, you know, on, on large parts of our consumer based economies. And then, you know, there's all this debt service, which way I thought very articulated laid out. So yeah, we're pretty negative. And, and again, yeah. everybody's looking at trailing earnings, but those are from 1231. You know, we're getting data every week, you know, consumer demands already dropped off, a, like dropped off a lot. Right. Uh, and, and industrials are, are whiffing on earnings. I mean, look at new right. car sales in the U S last week, they're down like yeah. 15%. Yeah. So, wow. I want to get to government policy because that's something that all of you have touched on in some way. Um, and, and way I'm going to come back to you because you really kicked us off on this, on this point by talking about, you know, government balance sheets. Uh, um, and, and of course in Canada, we've got, um, as I'm sure many people know on this, on this, uh, uh call, uh, federal budget this week, um, and um, kind of astonishing to me anyway to see commentary by um, some of the top bankers in the country on the weekend just kind of saying the government's not listening, right? And so that was pretty interesting to read. And so I'm curious about um, what your thoughts. I mean, is the governments have to radically uh, slash their spending? I mean, there's 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 clearly um, very little appetite for austerity, um, but do they have a choice, um, you know, given, given the rising cost of, uh, of debt servicing? Um, I think I would just, um, I would say that uh, just very much consistent with what Ted said, uh, just in general, I'm quite pessimistic as well, um, because it seems like we're in a kind of before a perfect storm. Uh, so, so, it depends on really how government will respond, of course. Uh, the central banks did really well um, during the pandemic and uh, got us now in a, I was in a very hot economy as of end of last year. Um, so how government, how government spending will change or how their support the system gonna matter a lot going forward. Um, and also, I just wanna quickly also build on um, uh, the, the, the high, high yield bond side. I think if you compare today's high yield bond or just corporate bond uh, world in general, uh, compare this to 10, 20 years ago, when we talk about investment grade, uh, really the majority fraction of investment grade bonds are triple Bs. We're, we don't see many double A's, you know, and, and that you were used to. And with the high yield bonds, we see a lot of triple C's. So, so we're looking at pretty much a low end uh, in each of those categories on their activity or their issues in the market. How the sort of market can accommodate, um, you know, those sort of low end uh, of each category on their activity. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, um, I, I think uh, back to what uh, Dan, you just asked me, I, I would say how government decides what to do next uh, is it, quite critical. Um, I, I think um, what kind of scenario we'll be seeing, uh, but either scenario in my mind is um, they're not too optimistic. Uh, so. <laughs> Um, so I hope maybe Jerry have a more optimistic view on this, but uh, yeah, but in general, I would say government policy going to matter a lot. Jerry, uh, what, what are your, what are your, what are your thoughts? And, and I recognize too the context here. I mean, um, you're you're the closest uh, geographically to um, the conflict in in Europe, and and uh, no doubt that's um, that's having an impact on on you know the the economic p picture. I'm curious as to your thoughts. Yeah, ab absolutely. Um, well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm certainly not in the optimist camp. Um, it, it's, it's, it's very hard to be. We're, look, we're late cycle, and uh, rates need to go up. Okay, so you, you're on borrowed time. Uh, the, I mean, that's the best thing you can say, and you can find, uh, you know, assets and companies. That have pricing power and uh, you know are are a bit more resilient in uh, you know with higher rates and, and certainly within the financial sector, uh, many of the banks over here have been praying for higher rates for you know for ten years, um, you know so so that's helpful, but um, uh, you know a late cycle tightening uh, with uh, slowing demand and and just um, um, you know sticky uh, inflation that's eating into um, you know consumer um, spending uh, and investment uh, is is not a um, a 
an elixir for um, for a good outcome. I'm afraid. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, can, and can, how, can I just make a, can I make a comment on this because I have very strong views on this? Yeah. I mean, listen, the government the government's not going to uh, do anything to promote austerity until they're forced to. Right. So, you know, there's, there's a big belief around the world that deficit spending doesn't matter, which I don't believe. And so they'll just keep spending money. Like, and, and this has been going on for 23 years. So, you know, post Clinton, basically, you know, the market has told governments that effectively outside of 2011, that like budget, you know, the deficit spending doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. And so inevitably you're going to need a crisis to get austerity. And, right. you know, and then at that point, it, it potentially is too late. The second thing that the government's really grappling with now, and it's really interesting actually, is the government doesn't want to get in the way of innovation, um, but they know they need to regulate certain things. So, yeah. you know, they're they're grappling with cryptocurrency. Like, what do we like? They know that they know that they need to do something, but they don't want to get in the way of, you know, entrepreneurship and and uh, you, you know commercialism and everything else. And the same thing can be said for you know it's going to be really interesting to see government policy towards climate change. You know, it's been the biggest topic. Yeah, yeah. The whole world has consensus on it. We need to, you know, fight climate change. And now oil is above 120. You know, Russia, even though their economy is smaller than Italy and it's smaller than Canada, they dominate very niche parts of our economy that are actually, we need what they do for, you know, our clean energy policy. So, right, you know, the right. fact that the U.S. government is negotiating with Iran and Venezuela on energy when Canada's like just north of them is crazy. Uh, and, is. and I think I think what you're gonna see is, I think this concept of um, isolationism is gonna to continue to go up. And it'll be interesting to see how world governments deal with climate change in the face of, you know, what's what's happened over the last, you know, three to six months. Yeah, we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna get to audience questions in a, in a, in a couple of minutes here, but, I, but, I, but, I, but maybe since you raised the issue of, of um, uh, climate risk in particular. I'm, I'm curious about your thoughts, and this is open to all, not, not just you, Ted. Um, just wondering how you think carbon pricing in different economies is going to affect economic forecasts by region. That's a question that's come up in the uh, in, in, in the in the uh, in the chat already. Well, look, let me you know, let me start because Europe is uh, at the proverbial coal face uh, of uh, this. Uh, you know, Germany very famously. Um, you know, shut down uh, nuclear uh, in 2011, ostensibly because of Fukushima, but really because Merkel needed to do a deal with the Greens. Um, I mean, that's the, that's the reality. So now, uh, you know, it, 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 for North America, it's an inconvenience. In, in Europe, it's, it's like no heating and no power. Right, that this is uh, kind of a uh, the reality, uh, and forced to buy um, you know oil and gas from uh, from Russia. Uh, no government will, in a sane way, um, advocate uh, either starving or freezing their people in the dark. So what you have a real risk of the agenda, not officially unraveling, but de facto um, unraveling. And no government can walk into an election with, you know, um, embracing, uh, you know, the, the COP26 agenda, even uh, here in, in the UK, which, which was a, a host is having a, a major um, rethink. So it's, it's less about you know, pricing of, of carbon and, you know, it, it's, it's a much more base and strategic um, reassessment of the, you know, of the equation. Hmm, interesting. Is that um, way, uh, Ted, what's, what's your, your thoughts on that? Are you, are you seeing the same thing or no? Yeah. I mean, I would say we say price of carbon. I mean, it comes in many forms, but inevitably, you know, uh, it's a declining resource. So when you, when you, when you don't build pipelines and you don't allow oil production, you make it very difficult. By definition, the price of carbon goes through the roof. Yeah. And so carbon is definitely going up. It'll be a tax on these economies. And it's a big question for each society on whether they're willing to bear that tax in the, in the spirit of global climate change. And in, in, and in, 
in robust times, like we've had the last couple of years, I think people are willing to do that. But when you're in a recession, and to Jerry's point, you know, unemployment's up and everything else, it's it's very the government. I would not want to be a government official right now. I mean, this is this is uh, it's a very very complicated and difficult thing. And yeah. and uh, but, you know, to, Jer I, to Jerry's point, like you know, we, we, you're you're gonna get to a point where you know the Canadian government's gonna really have to decide what to do on on these subjects. I mean, Canada makes 0.01 percent of the world's carbon emissions. Sure. And our whole economy is resource based, and you could argue we benefit from climate change. So, like, how does the government deal with all those things in the face of their promises they've made? Interesting. <laughs> That's a controversial perspective. Um, okay. I'm just well, saying it's the other perspective. I, I'm not saying I believe all that stuff. I'm just saying, you know, I think I think there's got to be a dialogue about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, but how does that square with with you know um, you know pressure from investors, uh, you know, engaged investors around ESG factors, uh, you know, because I mean, like, surely that's also um, making development of, uh, you know, fossil fuels more challenging. But, but I'll make a comment around that too, right? I mean, look at what happened on the weekend. You know, the JP Morgan and BlackRock ESG fund is way down because they own Russian and Ukrainian bonds. So right. I don't know what their screen is for ESG, but you know, I, I, you know, on any metric, I, I just don't see Russia passing any kind of ESG screen, and so I think, I think there's going to be a big shakeout in ESG, which yeah. is, you know, the SEC is getting very focused on this. It's going to start regulating it again. We're all pro ESG. You know, my firm is the first signatory onto the UNPRI, so don't take my comments out of context. Sure. But there's a lot of shenanigans, nonsense going on in the space, and it's the wild west. You can't, yeah. you yeah. can't get buy a portfolio of tech stocks with Apple and Google and call it an ESG fund because that's not what it is. Right. And so you need to, the, the, the government needs to provide guidance and put around guardrails to protect investors. And they know they need to do it. And they've done it in Europe. And, and for a bunch of reasons, the U.S. government doesn't want to follow the U.S., the European protocols and standards. But mm -hmm. it's a, this is a big topic of discussion amongst right. government officials right now. Yeah. 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 Maybe, Way, I'll, I'll invite you to jump in on this topic or, or you know, um, where there seems to be a trend towards a harmonization of standards. Uh, curious as to your your analysis on the, on this point. Yeah, because I don't have a lot to add. Um, I, I totally agree with <laughs> what Ted just said. Um, this, this is a new, new space and uh, there's still a lot of uh, ambiguity. Um, you know, what really is yes, yeah, the, what should we be focusing on and paying attention to. And uh, so, so yeah, I mean, this is still a topic that to be explored much, much more. And as you know, uh, we, we have, uh, Sustainable Finance Institute um, here at the Smith um, that was funded by um, some of our alums and donors. And uh, one, one of the uh, focus of the center is um, ESG investing. So um, that yeah. definitely needs more research and uh, more discussion. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Okay, I'm gonna pivot to uh, questions. Uh, it's uh, pr precisely the time when we, uh, we, we wanna move from our discussion to take some questions that have come up in, um, in the Q&A. And um, maybe um, a very practical question, um, you know, and I'm, and I'll, I'm gonna start with, uh, with you, um, Ted, on this one, because I think your firm is involved in, uh, in real estate, um, but a very practical question about housing prices going up, interest rates climbing, and, um, you know, the questioner wants uh, advice as to, uh, what millennials need to um, what what you recommend to millennials looking to make their 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 biggest life purchase, buy now or wait or or, or wait it out a little bit. Do you expect the housing market to cool um, or change materially in the next twelve months? Well, that's that's a hard one. So I'll, I'll take a stab at it, but I'm you should take everything I say with a grain of salt. Um, you know, listen. Uh, on the one hand, real estate is a great store of value in the face of inflation. So it theoretically should be a good investment. And number two, we all know rates are going up, which could be bad for housing prices, but you can lock in cheap financing today. The one thing in the US is that's very interesting is because of inflation. So like lumber prices are up 300%. Because of that- um, I, I'm in the middle of a renovation, I know. Yeah, well, so, 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 you know, they like housing prices a lot are going up because of inflation. They can't build houses in what's called the smile markets, which is, you know, uh, North Carolina, and it's like the Sun Belt, basically. Yeah. They can't build houses for the price that they're selling at. They're just they, 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 like the cost of goods sold between labor and stuff is is too high. And yeah. so there should be a, I mean, given that, if, if, if inflation doesn't abate, 
you should have continued high, higher housing prices just from a pure like marginal cost basis, which, you know, I've never ever seen a scenario where we're talking about marginal cost around housing, but it's a real consideration in a lot of markets in the US. So it's a long way away of saying, if you asked me to predict real estate prices over the last 20 years, I would have been wrong like every single time. So you should take, you should take my <laughs> views of the grain of salt. I think I think uh, you know the, the I hope the invitation to this webinar included you know the grain of salt asterisk which should apply, probably apply to every comment made here. So um, okay, um, uh, another question, and again I'll invite anyone to jump in on this one. Um, interesting question about the effects of COVID and how it's um, it, one of its effects was realizing advantages of reliable near shore sourcing, um, just enough as opposed to just in time sourcing given all the supply chain disruptions and you guys talked about that a little bit earlier um and so um wondering if you expect um wondering how you expect reduced globalization uh to impact future long-term economic growth i think it was you ted who said that everything is kind of upside down from the trends we've seen in the past um but i'd welcome thoughts from everybody on this topic and maybe jerry i haven't heard from you in a bit so i'll start with you on this one yeah, so I mean, clearly we've seen a reversal of some pretty uh, significant secular trends. Um, you know, I tend to think perhaps it was a just a a local maximum, and we're sort of receding from that. Uh, the, the trend uh, to um, you know to take advantage of comparative advantage and all those theoretical good things about trade. Uh, is, um, I think, is still intact. The big issue, however, is we've also transitioned from what was for, for most of the past, you know, um, uh, 40 years, uh, certainly 30 odd years, a unipolar world, yeah. right, where um, there was general alignment of economic order and, and sort of a predominance of the you know, liberal democratic order that everybody was was sort of pulling um, in the same direction. That's been broken. Uh, so in, in addition to the disruptive effects of the pandemic, you've also now got geopolitical questions that cause you to think, you know, gee, how, how would it, how would we feel if suddenly, you know, 80% of, of uh, chip um, capacity was, um, you know, was no longer in a, in a friendly jurisdiction. So I think you've got some uh, adjustment that will um, um, take place. Uh, I think there hasn't yet been an alignment within sort of the, this new order of, um, you know, of, of like-minded um, states. And it's just been turbulence in, in part pre-pandemic, uh, um, you know, um, political factors. And then, you know, we've had differing responses to the, uh, uh, to the pandemic. So mm -hmm. I, yes, I think you will see some um, nearshoring or reshoring, um, but, but I, I wouldn't say that we're done completely on sort of, you know, where we were. It's an right. adjustment. Right. Do you see a, uh, a to, to pivot to another related question? You know, given this deglobalization trend, one one questioner you know asks, uh, what future that you see for the U.S. dollar as a reserve currency? Does does do, is that affected in 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 some way in your view? No, I, I don't. I don't think so. It takes it takes an awfully long time and some pretty significant circumstances for that to uh, to change. Right. Um, Ted, you were the one who raised this point in the first place about uh, um, deglobalization. I, you didn't use that exact term, but I mean, I, I'd love your perspective on this topic too. Yeah, it's an, it's uh, to me, it's inevitable, and I think I mean I agree with what Jerry said. I mean, our companies are scrambling to to rebuild supply chains closer to home, um, and I think you know some of this recent geopolitical stress. I mean, we've also had world peace, generally speaking, for the last fifty years. And I think, you know, people are really giving thought to where, um, you know, the risks to their supply chain around very, very discrete products. So I think this is going to go on for a long time. And I think mm -hmm. the good news, the good and bad news is this. I mean, the good news, the good news, so the bad news is it means costs are higher, 
But yeah. actually, if you look at over time what's happened, the cost advantages of, of manufacturing in China and um, have really like eroded. So it used to be a huge advantage 10, 15 years ago, but they've had labor inflation themselves for a long time. So when you actually look at the numbers, like it's not, you know, like I'm on the board of a company in Canada that manufactures in Canada. And if they outsourced to, um, so they sell their products for call it $200 a unit, outsourcing to China saves a dollar. Mm -hmm. So just, it's just not worth it. And then, you know, and so, so I don't think the advantages of, you know, offshoring are what they were 20 years ago. And it's just not worth it, uh, given, you know, certainty and just in, just in time supply and all the things that, you know, you've been asked about. Yeah. And on the reserve well, currency, it's interesting. You know, the res oh, sorry, go, go ahead. No, 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 please go finish. I'm with Jerry, because the problem with the reserve currency is like, what else are you going to buy? And right. so, you know, you have to own something. So then you get in these debates, well, is it better to own the Chinese, you know, currency? Is it better to own Bitcoin? Like, and, and the answer is, I, I just don't see governments going that direction for a sustained period of time. It's probably good for gold. You know, right. we all grew up in the bit, we, we all grew up in a world where gold was the underpinning of these countries. And, yeah. you know, Russia, Russia's central bank just got all their dollars frozen. So it sends a pretty strong message to anybody who's adverse to the U.S., um, you know, about their U.S. dollars. So it's, it's yeah. probably good for some, on the margin for some, you know, quote unquote, historical stores of money. But I'm 100% I'm with Jerry. I, I just, you know, I, I just don't see the U.S. dollar going away. Sure. Um, there's been a lot of talk on the, about China and some questions about China as well. And Wei, maybe uh, I'd love your your outlook. I mean, it was interesting just seeing that that chart you presented. Actually, I guess from your perspective, I should do it this way: uh, the the uh, the growth curve on um, the the expectation of economic growth in China, how far down it's come since since before the pandemic. Um, what's your outlook for China? What are you watching? Yeah, I guess uh, before I go to China specifically. I just want to quickly comment on the deglobalization. Uh, you know, I, I don't disagree with what Ted and Jerry said, but I want to add a different perspective to it. Um, I mean, from the cost perspective, uh, yes, Chinese labor is being, the cost of Chinese labor has been going up. And we have seen a reallocation of manufacturing facilities to even Vietnam, to Cambodia, to these other Southeast Asia countries. But at the same time, um, I think this deglobalization is going to be a long, it's going to take a long period to achieve that. I mean, eventually, economics is going to matter more than politics, I think, when you come to a rational thinking. On a cost perspective, yes. Uh, but at the same time, we think about technology, infrastructure. You know, I know there was a talk of uh, shipping iPhone production from, from, from China or other, you know, um, Taiwan or to back to the U.S. But if you look at the, the years of the technology in terms of the production line and uh, that know-how, it takes to take years for the U.S. to catch up. I'm not saying it's impossible, just saying that infrastructure take a long time to build. So you, yeah. in the end, I would say economics matters. So I think China today, I wouldn't say it's, it's, it's still regarded as a low labor kind of, sorry, low labor cost country as people, most people viewed it, um, you know, many years ago. Its production, its economy has changed quite a bit. Um, I would say it possesses a lot of technology, uh, especially know-hows in terms of uh, mass production of high-tech products and so on. Mm -hmm. So that that will, you know, um, so so put this way, I, I wouldn't say we're going to go from 100% globalization to zero. We're going to achieve right. a level that's going to make sense. Um, and, and I'm sure some of the production will make more sense to ship them back to the U.S. or Canada or, or, or back to move them to the... Southeast Asia somewhere. Um, but on the China itself, I would say um, it, what worries me is um, how their policy on COVID gonna evolve because I think based on what I've seen, this is not going away, you know? Yeah. Um, and and uh, so when they shut down the big production centers like Shenzhen um, a few weeks ago and now Shanghai, and uh, I would say maybe other ports like Tianjin or other places, there could be cases arising, you never know. And uh, we'll see something like this shocks gonna come along in the near future. Um, now again, we'll make more people think, well, should we rethink about supply chain because of that? But I think eventually, um, I believe, you know, Chinese government will adopt more, I would say accommodating policy mm -hmm. uh, on dealing with COVID um, than the, what's going on right now. Right. 
Okay, I want shifting gears here. There are a few questions. Just again, uh, I, lo I love the very practical questions some folks ask. Um, you know, just about where you know what what are good short term investments. So I'm going to pool a couple of questions that that we've received here. Um, you know, um, one questioner asks whether uh, cryptocurrency is a good long term investment, um, and, and another just simply asking where should they be putting their short term investment money in, 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 in the one to three year horizon. So maybe uh, curious about your thoughts on, on that. Uh, whoever wants to to jump in. Well, uh, crypto, I'm too old, so um, <laughs> well, uh, you know, probably are too. I don't get it. <laughs> So I, I understand aspects of it. So uh, I'll defer on crypto. Uh, I'll do, let me just say quickly on, on short term, you know, it's difficult. We're, we're potentially at an inflection point, right? Um, and, and uh, you know, what, what you would um, want to say is, is to just keep maximum flexibility, uh, certainly the way I would look at it uh, over, over um the short run, um, and um, and be prepared to take advantage of any dislocation. Uh, Great, nice, 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 concise advice there, Ted. Advice from you. Yeah, I was hoping Jerry would take a different view on crypto. I <laughs> I've spent a crazy amount of time on this, and um, I'm kind of in the same category. I I think that I think that the, sorry, the what's, sorry, what ca what category. We say the same category. So I, I, we we found it to be uninvestable. Right. I think the thing that I think is a misnomer is everybody thinks it's a the democratization of markets, but I actually think it's the opposite. I, I actually think it's a market where a few big people can really uh, make a lot of money, and it's going to hurt a lot of little people. And um, and so you know it is. I think it's an insider's game, and I think people have to be very very careful. We've spent a lot of time you know, the proverbial, like, you know, sell the picks and axes, then, uh, you know, dig for gold. And again, we, we've had a really hard time, you know, coming up with good investment themes just around crypto. So a lot going on, a lot of incredibly smart people and very pedigreed people who are spending all their time on this. But um, yeah, I'm with Jerry. We, we haven't been able to figure it out yet. And then in terms Wait, of where to put money. Oh, go ahead. Oh, oh no, sorry. No, we actually, we want, we want the second part of your answer. Go ahead quickly, please. Um, yeah, and where to invest money? I mean, I mean, thematically, and this is again, this is I'm not talking my own book, but I am like, you know, what what you're seeing globally from all big pools of money is they're basically moving to more alternatives and more passive, you know, tactical allocations on liquid credit. I think people are or liquid anything, because I think people are coming to the conclusion it's very hard to to you know, on plain vanilla stuff, it's just not worth trying to outperform because it's hard. And so, you know, really give money to specialists and in very interesting niches. And, you know, I can go to a lot of examples of it, but, you know, we were just with a big uh, state pension fund yesterday and they're going to take their alternative allocation to 50%, five zero. So this theme is has been good a big for theme for 20 years, but it's managers. continuing. Yeah, I was just saying it's good for alternative asset managers. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, great stuff. Way uh, quickly from you on that. We're almost out of time, but I'd love to. Yes, talk. I'll be very quick. I think on crypto, I just want to make one comment is I still don't know it's it's a currency or commodity. I, I think that that answer that question will, will, will help you to decide how, how to view it and how to invest it. Um, I remember I looked into the space a lot in 2017. Back then, crypto was going up a lot. There were just a lot of scams and um, I got to say, um, uh, bad things, but now with the market become more mature, I think the question you're gonna ask is, it is a currency commodity. That's the first question. I still don't know the answer to that. Um, on the short-term investment, I, you know, I, I don't like to give investment recommendation because they tend to be pretty bad. Um, but I would say um, during a recession, cash is king. Um, if we're expecting the rates gonna go up and we'll end up in a recession, I would say, I agree with Ted, holding liquid assets will be the key. Plus, I would say maybe realistic that could be potentially, you know, inflation proof. Um, so, you know, don't take my advice; it's just my personal view. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, look, we're we're I think we're out we're out of time for the discussion, but what a rich one it's been. Um, and I got to say, I mean, while 
Well, while everyone said they were pessimistic, um, it was interesting to see a few glimmers of opportunity that you're finding nonetheless. And I'm grateful for those, those little glimmers as I think we all are. So we've heard, talked about, de about deglobalization, about nearshoring, about you know, the importance of keeping maximum flexibility in the short run, taking advantage of dislocation, being wary of, of insiders games, uh, you know, and focusing on specialist niches. niches. So great advice, um, you know, and, and we will of course take everything with a grain of salt as we always should, but I very much want to thank uh, Wei Wang and Ted Goldthorpe and Jerry Del Messier for sharing their insights uh, with us as uh, fellow members of the, uh, the Smith community. Um, and before we wrap, uh, I want to take a moment to remind our audience that Queen's Executive Education has uh, an incredible range of, um, of really interesting uh, management developing courses uh, through remote and in-person learning. Um, this can, of course, uh, help to, uh, you know, help you better understand risk and seize opportunities um, wherever you are and whatever you do. So you can check out uh, smithqueens.com slash exceed for more details on upcoming events. So I wanna thank everybody uh, for joining us today um, and particularly our panelists, but also all of you as members of our community. Um, I'm Dan Tish and delighted to uh, host our session today. Thanks and we'll see you all in the months to come.